Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Could you suppose that suddenly one of the most simple functions in the world was denied you? That you couldn't, uh, let's say, open a door or get out of bed or strike a match or swallow the food in front of you. Even if all the other mundane actions of life continued, would any normal process of living be feasible if in one area you were completely bewitched? Our mystery drama, The Unbearable Reflection, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Patricia Elliott and Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. We are a nation that looks for idols to worship. And one of our fetishes is beauty. Along with that goes another, success. By any measure, Deborah Denton qualifies. Miss America in a not-too-distant year, sometime movie star, and now wife of one of our biggest state's governors, a man who is of presidential timber. That's Debbie. She is everything to hold up to America, man and woman, as an example. A strict religious upbringing, beauty, success in many fields, a press agent's dream, except for one thing. What we see on the surface is exactly the opposite of the real Deborah Denton. Zip me up, will you, darling? I hate to. It makes it so finer. Ah, oh, Nick, I'm already late. I'm going to have to burn up the parkway to get back in time for dinner. You could have it with me. Zip first, talk later. Ah, soon, Nicholas, my love. First, I have to get rid of my husband. Divorce him? Not while he's still a possible candidate. You don't want to be named as a co-respondent in a divorce suit that hits every headline, do you? Let me buy your husband off, huh? Unfortunately, that is the one thing you can't do. I worship at your feet. How can I own you? Oh, you are a marvelous lover, darling. Not only poetic, ah, but so rich. And I must run. I'll see you to the door. Better not. Let's not take any chance of being seen together. Since the day I took my first step, I've known just where I wanted to go. From the beginning, men have been the central influence in my life. <laughs> the first, my father. Hard, bigoted, blindly devoted to a barren, demanding religious fervor that he tried to force on everyone. My only way out was to run. Which I did with the first man I could persuade I was old enough to take me across the state line. Fortunately, my father was drowned in a flood shortly after, so my little mouse of a mother came to stay with me and eventually provided me with enough wholesomeness to run for my first beauty contest. The rest of my story has been told in every newspaper across the country and around the world. But the true story will only be told here as my last confession. As soon as I returned to the governor's mansion, I immediately crossed the hall to the private entrance of my husband's office. John, I'm back. Come in. The door's open. What? What are you doing here, Lewis? Looking for a miracle. What sort of a miracle do you expect to find in my husband's files? Something, anything to use against the lieutenant governor. Against Frank? Now, why would you, John's campaign manager, want to attack or hurt his running mate? Deborah, where have you been all afternoon? I've been... Shopping. What business is that of yours? My dear Mrs. Denton, there's no need to look guilty. Why should I be interested in your... whatever pursuits brought you home so glowing and alive and happy, even though empty-handed? I merely ask because obviously you haven't heard the news. What news? At a party luncheon, our esteemed senior Senator Walter Price announced that he was withdrawing his support for your husband in the coming campaign. Why? The uh, stated reason was a disagreement over fundamental fiscal policies. And Governor Stanton's lack of a firm stand on law and order. Your husband is no better than an also-ran after Price's speech today. Where is John? 
With Sam, the party boss? Sam Waters won't desert him. Sam Waters would cut his mother's throat without batting an eyelid, and your husband has been standing in his way for one term. That's more than enough. What do you mean, standing in his way? John has been a wonderful governor, and everyone knows that this is only a stepping stone to... To the presidency? That was your dream, wasn't it? I don't intend to discuss that with you. What do you mean about John standing in Sam Waters' way? Patronage, my dear lady. The name of the political game. There's been precious little of it since John took over the state house. Because my husband happens to prize his honesty. We've hitched our wagon to the wrong star. We'd both better begin to break out the parachutes and start looking for a nice soft landing. Oh, so you're going to run out on John? No. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking me ridiculous. I despise you, Lewis Stark. You are contemptible, conniving, evil, and totally dishonest. And when I tell my husband what you say behind his back, oh, wouldn't dare to tell him to his face. I'll tell him when I'm ready. He won't have to wait. I'll take care of that. I doubt it. Unless, of course, you want me to tell him where you really were this afternoon. What? Are you having me followed? Oh, in a sense. You were at the Woodmere Motel from approximately 2 until 5 this afternoon. Quite a bit out of town, you know. You joined Mr. Joseph Martin in his private bungalow. Of course, we both know that that name is only a cover. His real name... That is enough. What are you trying to find out? Nothing yet. Patience is the one virtue I lay claim to. That sounds like the governor now. I guess you'd better leave us alone to put our heads together and see what we can pull out of the fire. I went up to my room, seething. From the first moment I had laid eyes on that beady-eyed, sardonic little toad, I had hated him. I took a tranquilizer and some aspirin, and I sat down before my mirror to try to smooth out the worry lines. I opened my makeup drawer to make some repairs, and there, staring me in the face, was the ultimate irony. A birthday gift that Lewis had presented me with a gun to, quote, afford protection while my husband was out campaigning. Knowing now what he knew about me, oh, I would have liked to use it on this man who had given it to me if only I could get away with it. I I pushed the gun back out of sight. I knew that John disapproved of firearms. It was fortunate that I had pushed it back because without his usual polite knock, John was suddenly in my room. Why, John, darling, you, you surprised me. Oh, I'm sorry. I just had some pretty bad news. What? It uh, looks as though you're not going to be the governor's lady much longer. Oh, you mean you've decided not to run again? I mean the party has decided not to support me if I try to run. Then run independently. Not a chance. First of all, I haven't the money... I have no personal wealth, no sources to draw on. Does it have to cost so much? If you go to the people, you know you have their support. Yeah, I had. Till I cut the budget, raised taxes, tried to make the state solvent. Well, you know that Sam and Lewis felt that you could have waited. Oh, sure. Sam and Lewis aren't interested in principles on the public good, only votes. Everything I've tried to do to help the little guy, I mean, the kind of man I consider myself... It'd be twisted into a mistake if your code of honor is politics first. Well, perhaps it was a mistake to veto the death penalty when you knew everyone was up in arms at the appalling crime rate. I would always veto that. In my opinion, it's against the morality of both man and God. All right, my darling, we won't argue about it. Now, here. Let me sit with you for a minute. Oh, Debbie, darling, I... I really don't care for myself. As a matter of fact, in a way, I'm relieved. Relieved? Yes. We can live our own lives now. Start having the first of those children we should have had already. Enjoy and get the most out of life for ourselves. <laughs> what will you be doing for a living? Oh, go back to the law. Oh, <laughs> at that same pokey little firm. I imagine Ed would be glad to have me back. And I suppose reflected glory could get me in with some of the bigger firms. 
come on, darling. We'd uh, better get dressed for the Chamber of Commerce dinner tonight. Debbie, you know, sometimes I wonder if you really love me. Or is it just the glamour and all the expectations for the future? Oh, be careful, my darling. Now, don't muss me, please. Well, I'm just rubbing against your hair. Oh, beautiful you are. And yeah, look at your reflection in the mirror. Was there ever a more beautiful woman? You know, Debbie, sometimes I think for all my beliefs and my hatred for violence, if I ever found out there was anyone who wanted to steal you from me, if I ever suspected for a moment that some other man dared or you permitted him intimacies which are ours alone, I, I think I would revert to the animal that lives in all of us. And destroy all three. You, me, and... <laughs> oh, forgive me, darling. I I don't know what came over me talking nonsense like that. It's just that I love you so. The Chamber of Commerce dinner was long and tedious. I was sent home early with the lieutenant governor's wife. But not before Lewis had informed me that John, contrary to his normal habits, had been drinking quite a bit. But he assured me that it would be all right and that he would make sure he got safely home. I was sitting at my dressing table, taking off my makeup, when suddenly, impossibly, Lewis was beside me, visibly shaken and frantic. Deborah. How the devil did you get in here? That doesn't matter for the moment. I'm here to tell you to lock your door when I leave. And whatever you do, don't let John come in. And remember the pistol I gave you. What are you talking about? He's found out about you and Nicholas. How? Never mind how. When I left him, he was loading his hunting rifle. For heaven's sake, when I leave, lock your door. Are you suggesting that I should be afraid of John, the most... Debbie, he is not himself. He's out of his mind. He... Good Lord, here he comes. Defend yourself, Deborah. Get your gun. He's out for blood. Debbie! <gasps> Tell me it isn't true. For God's sake, not now. Not you deserting me. John! John, put down that... that gun! What gun? Tell me it isn't true about you and Nick Ross. I and Joggle all by heaven, I... No! <laughs> It's all right, Deborah. He's dead. Quite dead. How do you know? Call a doctor. Get someone here. How do you know? Because this is exactly how I arranged it. Uh, arranged it? Certainly. What better way to get you in my power? Do you feel there's something strangely out of kilter in this sudden event? Something that does not ring quite true? Or perhaps a better phrase is something unnatural? For we have just passed the boundaries of a finite world to the supernatural, the unexplained, the terror of something beyond a human being's ability to have foreseen, or now that it has happened, to cope with. I'll return shortly with Act Two. seldom in life has Deborah Denton committed an act not motivated by her own volition. But on this one of very few times, she has done what would have seemed impossible to her. She has lost her head completely and committed homicide. Not only that, but in front of a witness. The last witness in the world she would have wanted to be there. Instinct tells her that she is caught in a trap but more than that, some unfathomable prescience sounds a knell within her that the trap is worse than could humanly be possible. What do you mean, in your power? You just murdered your husband in front of me. It wasn't murder. It was self-defense. You saw he, he was going to kill me. Kill you? With what? With the hunting rifle. What rifle? The one he had in his hands. The one... <gasps> I don't see any gun in his hands or anywhere near him. But, but, but you said that he... Did had... I? I don't think I remember that. But you must. Now, you burst in here, and you said that John had been drinking at the dinner, and that he was loading his rifle, and that he knew about Nicholas. My me. dear Deborah, John Stanton drunk and loading a rifle when you knew his aversion to guns of any kind? Would anyone believe he would, could even use a gun? And how could he have found out about you and Nicholas? 
I don't know. From you, I suppose. Now, really. Why should I make trouble between you and John? And I didn't burst in here. Oh, at least that's the truth. How did you get in here? <laughs> that's another matter. Which I don't care about for the moment. You are a witness. And hostile or not, any good lawyer will catch you in your lies and your tricks as soon as he gets you on a stand. Only he won't. Why not? Because I'm not here. The servants have heard the shots and sent for the police. When they come, they'll find you and the dead man alone. You can't get out of this house without being seen. Can't I? Watch. Lewis. Lewis. Lewis, where are you? Here I am, Deborah. I don't know what's happening. I must be going crazy. It's a dream. That's all. A, a dream. Oh, no, it isn't. Not at all. But it can be. How? I'm quite aware how you feel about me. But have you ever wondered how I feel about you? I... Of course you haven't. I'm dirt under your feet. Now, I warned you not to underestimate me. Now, I might be able to help you if... Who are you? You're... You're inhuman. I think perhaps that's a fair statement. <laughs> it was really amusing when you first saw me in your room that you should have chosen to say, What the devil are you doing here? Who you are? Satan himself? Oh, no, no, my dear. Nothing quite so grandiose. Just a minor demon, a faithful henchman of the anti-faith. Oh, it has to be a dream. There can be no changing the fact that John is dead. That's a fait accompli. But the manner of his death, the place where it happened, and the time can be arranged to suit our convenience, or rather yours, in such a way that you will appear to have had nothing to do with it. And in return, I sign a paper in blood selling you my soul. Oh, now, really, Deborah? Surely you don't subscribe to that old-fashioned medieval nonsense? This is the 20th century. Why would I want your soul? I... I don't know. I, I mean, isn't that what is always required when you... Traffic with the devil? I wouldn't know. I told you I'm only minor league. Besides, your soul is committed to hell already, my dear. Then what do you ask in exchange? Your body, my beautiful one. Your soul has no interest for me. You must be mad. All right. We'll play it your way. We'll pretend this farce is real. Now, what could you do about John? Set the clock back. John did have a couple of drinks. He left the hotel alone in his car. On the way home, he lost control and smashed into a wall. The car was totaled and he was instantly killed. And me? You were already at home. You were having a long talk with the housekeeper when it happened about getting a new maid. How could you know that? I put the idea in your head. Why? For reasons of my own, which you will discover later. You can arrange all this. In exchange for you. No. I was afraid of that. You are loathsome and disgusting to me. I don't need your help and I can get through this by myself. I wouldn't put it past you. It would be hard to find a jury to convict you. Or at least condemn you to death. John does have a rifle. It'll be beside him by the time the police get here. And then you'd better hurry. No. Ha, I might as well be dead or in hell if I belong to you. Very well. I'll make you one last offer. What? If I can't have you yourself, I'll settle for the vicarious. Sell me your reflection. My reflection? That other self who looks back at you from the mirror. All right. Yes. It's almost too late. Quickly. Here. Quickly. Sign here. There. And the pact is made. There was a shutter and slash. And a wild feeling as though the world had stopped spinning on its axis. I was conscious that the police siren had cut off. As though by a switch being thrown. And that John's body... Aunt Lewis had disappeared. The last thing I remember in my half-consciousness was the fantastic sight of the glass fragments from the broken vanity mirror which one of my shots had scattered, lifting and gathering in the air and coming together into the mirror again. And then... I must have fainted. I was awakened by a soft but insisting knocking at my door. Uh, just a minute. Who is it? It's 
Elspeth, Mrs. Denton, ma'am. Who? Mr. Lewis Stark said you'd be needing me. Lewis Stark? Uh, just a moment. I I'll unlock the door and let you in. Oh, that won't be necessary. <gasps> Here, let me help you up. No. No, don't, don't touch me. Who, who are you? Why, Mr. Stark told me you and your housekeeper had been discussing your needing a lady's maid. So I came to apply. Uh, at this time of night? He said it might be sort of urgent. And that you might be needing someone with my special sort of references. And what are those? You should sit down, ma'am. Uh, here. Here, by your vanity table. Oh. Thank you. I, I, I am a bit shaky. It's why Mr. Stark thought of me. What are you, a nurse? Nothing like that. Just what I am. Just what you need. Well, if I do, it's not tonight. I don't want you here tonight. Are you sure, ma'am? Of course I... What do you mean? Look in the mirror, Mrs. Denton. I don't want to look in the mirror. I can imagine after the nightmares I've been having what I... Look I'm... in the mirror. Oh, anything for a little piece of... Now, do you see why you need someone like me around? Oh! 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 What else they showed me in the mirror was nothing. Reflected in the background were all the normal things I expected to see. The, the Austrian curtain draped by the window, a sampler which my mother had needle pointed for me, the, the great canopy bed to my left. And to the right, the chaise lounge and part of the closet door. But, but in the center of all, in the center of all where I should have been, was nothing. I don't mean a blank or the outline of a shape, just nothing at all. As though the mirror reflected only an empty room. You see... But I... It can't be. Oh, g give me my hand glass. Here, madam. Well? N nothing. The same. Oh, my... What am I going to do? That's why Mr. Lewis Stark thought you might have need of me. How can you help? Can you bring my likeness back? No. But I can protect you. How? First, by keeping people away from you. Or more important, you away from them. But, but if John is dead, I, I, I can't just hide. No. But you could have need for a nurse, someone to take care of you. We can establish that the shock of his passing has brought on a, a skin disease you wish to cloak from anyone's eyes, particularly from your own. How will that help? A logical reason for getting rid of all the mirrors in the house, for guarding against the surprise photographer, for concealing the truth, as long as you must be in the public eye. <gasps> Shall I get it for you? Uh, no, 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 I'll get it. <laughs> At least I'm safe on the phone. Uh, uh, hello? Baby? Oh, it's you. Can you talk? Uh, just a moment. Would you mind leaving me alone, please? To talk to me close? Or should I use the cover name? Damn you. Since we are sisters under the skin, I shall quietly disappear. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, uh, hello? All right. No, I... Uh, but, but we can talk now, Nikki. W what is it? I just heard the news. News? About John. On my car radio. Is it true? What did they say? Just that he apparently lost control of his car on the parkway and smashed into the wall of an underpass, and that he must have been killed instantly. Oh, thanks, Peter. What did you say? Uh, oh, Debbie... You know, don't you? I mean... Uh, yes, it, it, it's, it's all right. I, I, I know. Oh, for a moment there, I thought I'd made... Uh, well, I, I don't mean to be ghoulish, but uh, I have a wonderful idea for us. What? You are a grieving widow. What is more natural that you should want to get away? You go to Europe on a trip and steal away to my island. Oh, I have such a room for us, all glass. What is not windows to the sun and sea is mirrors. I can see you there, my darling. Not just the magic of you alone, but reflection after reflection. Maybe. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. 
I got huh? carried away. Huh? You'll forgive me. But I, I, I want you so. I, I need you so. And I want you to be my bride. Once you are, I will buy you the world. Oh, my darling, I, I want that too. I just... Give me time to, to think. I'll call you tomorrow. What am I going to do? <laughs> you see what I meant? Especially if, what? Especially if you have a lover or wish to take another husband. How do you explain you have no reflection in the mirror or in a still pond or a, a store window passing by or even no shadow in the brightest sunlight? You don't have to keep reminding me. I know how I've been cheated. Not cheated, ma'am. Just outmaneuvered. How could you expect to win when the devil held the dice? <laughs> that Deborah Denton schemed to gain. Wealth beyond imagining as Niklo Sarinjuglo's wife seems now denied her. Can she outwit the devil? Or is she already doomed? A haunted figure who casts neither shadow nor reflection, set apart forever from everyone else. I shall return shortly with Act Three. three days were the most difficult of Deborah Denton's life. Heavily veiled, even though it was summer, constantly on the lookout for a revealing mirror or the flash of a camera before she had a chance to hide behind someone. She was physically exhausted by the time the body was at last interred. And of all the interviews, the most unsettling and frightening to her was a stolen few minutes with Niklos. My deepest condolences, Mrs. Denton. Thank you, Nicholas. I waited till the end of the line. Can't we be alone for a moment? So kind of you to send those lovely flowers. I can't, Nick. Not here. I had nothing but admiration for the governor. There, it's important. He was a fine man, and the state will mourn his loss. We all will. You can walk me to the hall. I'll pretend to feel faint. <gasps> Mrs. Denton, are you all right? Oh, just a little faint. Ah. I'm all right, ladies and gentlemen. I, I just need to rest. Nicholas, if you will be good enough to give me your arm to the stairs, please, please forgive me. I, I'll try to join you again later. Just lean on me, Mrs. Denton. Ah. Let me get the door. Oh, thank you. Who is that young woman you brought with you? That is my niece. That is why I have to talk to you. I have to get her back to Greece very soon. No, no, I... wait. Wait for me. I, I can meet you there as we planned or come back for no. you. No, 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 don't leave me now. I need you. Oh, you're not well, Debbie. Not yourself. Maybe we should wait until... The... Until what? Till, well, uh, till the rash or whatever it is that makes you wear that veil. Oh, that, that is nothing. I, I... Oh, ca ca can't I see you tonight, my darling? Uh, well, uh, why don't you phone me after... What is it? I don't know. Crazy, but... I happened to be looking at that mirror as we passed, and I could swear... What mirror? That one. Hanging over the chest. Who put that back? I don't know. But it was so strange. I could swear, looking in it, that I was all alone. Oh, no, don't, don't be silly. No, no, come back just a moment. I have got to lie down. Are, are you trying to change the subject? No, I... Well, what about tonight? Uh, call me later and check. You know where. I doubt if many men could appreciate, but I'm sure every woman can, the agonizing frustration of being deprived of the use of a mirror or anything in which one can view oneself. The terror of feeling that you are alive no longer, that you only exist for yourself. Furtively, I found a small mirror from an old pocketbook and checked. Oh, no matter what the angle, there was still no answering image of my face. And I could not rid myself of the sight of the beautiful young woman that Nicholas called his niece. I doubted her, hated her, was sick with jealousy for her. Oh, not for Nick himself, but for the wealth and power he meant to me. 
now that John was gone. I was ready to crawl, to beg, to plead for any small chance from the vile thing that had become my master. You wanted to see me, Deborah? Yes, Lewis. Someone hung a mirror in the hall. Do you know about it? Why, yes. I had it replaced. Why? Hundreds of people have come to pay their respects to the late governor. Half of them women. The mirror may not be a necessity, but the total absence of any is missed. I don't believe you. You had it hung to torture me. Or just to remind you. I want my reflection back. Are you sure? Sure. I am sure of nothing, thanks to you. Oh, I know I made some kind of pact with you. And I don't expect any mercy, but I hope, I beg, that there is some life left for me. If, if I am to be dragged at last into a hell that is as eternal and is as devastatingly destructive as the last days have been, I am asking you for some last fling at life before you and yours swallow me up forever. <laughs> You're worried about Nicholas and his niece. Yes. And quite right. The relationship is close. But not familial. Do you mean that she... Oh, that of was course a... she's not his niece. But then in spite of her desires, she's not yet been able to capture his entirely. You are a master at this, aren't you? To turn a person slowly on the spit, never burning, only scorching. We're two of a kind. How many men have you turned on the spit? Hopelessly bound and tied by your beauty and promise only to abandon them after their purpose had served yours. Supposing I admit it, will that gain me any comradeship with you? What is it you want? So little. My mirror image back again. You're sure that's all? That is all I dare to ask, isn't it? And how will it serve you? Even at the simplest level. A woman cannot live without a reflection. She needs it to begin, live, end her day. And for your sort of woman to reaffirm your strength, for what are you without beauty? Oh, you knew so well when you took it from me. I would be back on my knees to beg for it. I was damned the day I agreed. I can't live as ordinary people do. I need Nicky's money, position, power. Neither can the rest of us. The rest of us? We, the powers of darkness, the strength of the world, which will ultimately make it our own. <laughs> I don't mean to align myself with you. How can you help it anymore? Just let me warn you, Deborah. If I return your image, it may not be what you expect to see. It will be what I want the world to see. Can you be so sure? It will be me, won't it? Of course. I'll sign anything more for that chance. There's no need for that. Call your lover. Win him back from his niece, if you can. By the time you two can meet, your mirror image will have returned. I want it now. Some things are possible, but not all. You must wait until you meet him again. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't rush things. There is still time to... You are a fantastically attractive man, my darling, but I don't quite trust that niece of yours. Oh, come to me. Make it ten o'clock. It'll be nice and dark by then. And Elspeth will be waiting. Do I expect you? You know, all you have to do is ask. I'll be there. I hung up the phone and sat for a long time thinking. I couldn't rest. So I called Elspeth and made arrangements for Nicholas to be admitted to the house. If you're sure you want me to, Mrs. What Denton. What are you talking about, Elspeth? I told you I did. Why wouldn't I want you to? I'm sure it's none of my business, but... If I were you, I might talk it over with Mr. Stark. Why? Oh, he's the only one who could answer that, ma'am. Something about that long, set, grim face troubled me. I, I realized suddenly that it was the almost imperceptibly twisted, evil smile breaking the tight line of her mouth. I, I could feel my heart drop like a stone into a dark and bottomless pit. And suddenly, Lewis Stark, whoever or whatever he was, was standing before me. Lewis! It's nine o'clock. I thought you should have time to think things over. What are you doing here? Oh, don't worry, I shall be gone long before your lover appears. If you're sure you want him to. Why don't you leave me alone? Haven't you done enough to me? This time I thought I would do a kindness. You wanted your reflection back. You promised 
me. As you are. I thought perhaps you'd better look at it before your lover comes. Look. I promise you it is a perfect mirror image of you. For some reason, I... I am afraid to look. What you see, everyone else will see. Remember, it is your true reflection, and you live or die by it. What does that mean? See for yourself. I will. But by myself. This time, the gun is loaded. I want you out of here. Look on yourself, Deborah. I had no will of my own for that moment. Standing with the gun in my hand, I turned to the mirror which Elspeth had restored to the vanity. And there I saw a loathsome parody of myself. The hair twisting and writhing about my face like black snakes. The iris of my eyes dull, muddy brown with great dark bruises beneath them. My nose hooked as fiercely as an eagle. My lips drawn in a snarl, their purple color stretched to a death white over two great canine teeth leering back at me as, as lasciviously as any vampire's. Is that what you want your lover to see? No, no, that isn't me. The real you. No, I'll kill it. If you do, you kill yourself. Sing to hell with both of us. Oh, God, no. Uh... It's all right, Deborah. He's dead. Just as dead as always. Only one difference. What? It will take time. The trial, the headlines, jail, oh. and then a long wait for the death sentence to be carried out. Oh. Everything your husband fought against. How do you know? How can you be so sure? Because we're right back where we started. This is exactly how I arranged it. Arranged it? What better way to get you in my power, Deborah? This time, forever. No need to dwell on a sensational trial and the most ironical of circumstance that a governor who was forced to sign a bill re-establishing the death sentence in his state made his wife the first victim as he himself was the first victimized. I'll be back in a moment. The most damaging witness at the trial of Mrs. Denton, wife of the former governor, was Louis Stark, who reluctantly but devastatingly, under questioning, sealed her death warrant. The audience was sorry for this seemingly sympathetic and unhappy man. But then, as Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, the devil's most devilish when respectable. Our cast included Patricia Elliott, Mandel Kramer, Robert Dryden, and Carol Titel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Tonight's WOR Mystery Theater was also brought to you in part by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less. The preceding program was furnished by CBS Radio.